This is Belgium today. A heavy mist hangs over lush green fields as sheep quietly graze on thick grass. A rooster crows in the distance. Birds chirp as the wind rustles through the trees, giving a sense of peace and security, a sense of freedom. Across the fields, a steeple from an old church draws your eyes to a Belgian community. This tranquil scene is not far from Ypres, a small Flemish market town close to the French border, where the streets are filled with the hustle and bustle of daily activity. Shopkeepers eagerly display their goods. It's a festive atmosphere in the town square, but it hasn't always been. Beneath this reconstructed city and hidden in surrounding hills and fields lie the scars of war that cast a dark shadow on the world's soul. Outside this community and in many European countries, in the mud and the misery, millions died fighting for freedom. Belgians, French, British, Americans and Canadians, including a large contingent of Aboriginal Canadians, whose restless souls, it's believed, are still lying in wait, hoping to someday return home. Under this parcel of land is a covert military bunker, a communication center for Western forces during the Cold War. For decades, its existence was a state secret. Now, with the end of the Cold War, it's been declassified. This seems like the ideal location for a contingent of Aboriginal leaders, Métis, First Nations and Inuit, to gather to host a spiritual ceremony aimed at calling out to their fallen brothers to encourage their spirits to come home. It's a long time coming. I think. Uh, uh, many of these discussions that our uh, families have had and uh, you know, the kinship that has taken place where people have talked about uh, you know that their brother or uncle or their father or grandfather never came back uh, you know to close off this part of their life where one of their loved ones uh, you know actually never never came home after they were willing to sacrifice their life uh, for to protect our country and I think this coming home ceremony is is going to find that closure. This is a journey into a new dimension, a spiritual dimension, spawned by a vision delivered on the wings of an eagle to Métis elder Ed Borchard. That vision is about to become reality. But before the journey across the sea of time could begin, the site would need to be carefully prepared. While awaiting the arrival of spiritual elders, an advanced team begins the job of transforming this area. Uh, we're going to try to center this off so. We're using uh, our measuring rope that we've been using, and we're just gonna start spreading these poles out evenly along the lodge here. The territory is carefully mapped to determine where to build the main tent which will house the sacred ceremony. Constructing the spiritual lodge would prove to be exhausting hard work. A steady rain makes the logs slick, and tying them together into a skeletal frame and then gingerly lifting them into place presents more than a few challenges. Despite the cold temperatures and long days, the group is united, working with a quiet determination. The men and the women that work together, work together as a, as a group. We then try to uh, overstep anybody. We, we just work together and I felt really honored. An eagle feather hangs over the site as a sign of power and protection. 
First Nations view it as a link, a messenger between the people and the Creator. First Nations teepees, also known as the Angel's Jacket, are carefully erected to keep out the wind and the rain. Historically, teepees were used as homes on the Canadian prairies, but today they're mainly used for sacred ceremonies. With the flaps, uh, when you have a fire in there, you put this flap up and this one down, then the smoke is able to come out and go this way. Same with this side, flap up, flap down, and the smoke will go this way. These willows, harvested from the nearby countryside, will be used to construct sweat lodges. Spiritual leaders like Dominic Rankin will gather with others around the fire inside and call out to the spirits of the fallen soldiers. I'm going to be here 10 days maybe, I don't know how many days. I'm going to set up my sweat lodge to, uh, to be well and to do a uh, sweat lodge with my brothers and sisters here. And, um, we're going to have a two uh, ceremony pipe to have a peace inside each people here. And uh, to say thank you to these uh, warriors here. Calling out to the spirits and sharing the pipes would remain confined to the sacred site, away from prying eyes and cameras. We never allowed cameras to, uh, to uh, take pictures of our ceremonies because it's, um, it's just the way of our people. We never allowed you know, anything to be um, shown on a camera or, have, or a, a video machine. And it, it's just the way, it's the way our grandfathers taught us to, not like when we did our ceremonies years, years ago. When, my grandmother and my grandfather were still alive and my parents and aunties and uncles, they did it underground. They didn't want anybody to know what our ceremonies are about. So I'm very honored, still honored that they're not shown in videos and all that. What the viewers need to understand is that uh, uh, the elders are gonna, they're gonna come, they're gonna do the ceremony and, and uh, they have the gifts to do, to do these things, and uh, and we just we need to believe in them. And I know I believe in them. I believe what they're going to do here. You know, so uh, uh, that's the easiest way I could say to uh, to the viewers to believe that this is happening. The soldiers, these 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 passed on soldiers, are going to be coming home. Their spirits are going to come home. Uh, uh, a heaviness is going to be lifted off of this land, off of off of the battlefields where they where they died. During the First World War, Ypres was destroyed by the Germans. The pillars and the frames of the towers are all that remain of the town's cathedral and main market hall, known as the Cloth Hall. The Belgian community was the scene of some of the worst fighting between 1914 and 1917. By the end of the Great War, more than 31 million soldiers on both sides were either killed or injured, including over 200,000 Canadians. 7,500 First Nations, Inuit and Métis also served. People in Belgium have long known and very much uh, appreciate the contribution that the Canadian forces made in the First World War and in the Second World War. Uh, to the liberation of their country. But they're not so aware that within the Canadian forces there was a very significant and important Aboriginal uh, dimension. And uh, I think that this w having this ceremony here will open their eyes to a whole other dimension uh, of our reality, and that's a very good thing. It will also do the same, I think, for, for Canadians in Canada who may not fully understand the, uh, the, the very great sacrifices that were made by Aboriginal Canadians. I'm very proud to be a part of this. It's honoring my nation, my Métis nation, and our Métis veterans who came over here and served our country and liberated the Belgian people and a lot of the European people. Just before a group of Belgian school children arrives to learn about Aboriginal culture, the advance team prepares a fire. 
It will be a fire similar to this that will burn around the clock in the sacred lodge, a focal point for the ceremonies that will begin in a few short days. Education is an important component of the spiritual journey, especially to involve young Belgian children. One of the things that's very sacred to us is water. To teach them about Canadian Aboriginals who have their own distinct culture, music, languages and history. We are called the children of the fur tree. Métis, who are of mixed First Nations and European ancestry who identify themselves as Métis, distinct from First Nations and the Inuit, who live mainly in Canada's far north. If you ask children, uh, they will tell you, well, an Aboriginal, first of all, is called an Indian, and second, they have feathers on their heads, they wear leather clothes with long fringes, and they live in teepees, and they have totem poles, and they don't have a clue how they live today. So there's a lot of misunderstanding about Aboriginals. The cultures are different. Um, yes, I think that the Canadian music is very more beautiful than our music. I learned that the um, people from Europe and um, Canada, they, ha they played the, uh, the fiddle. Aboriginal leaders believe young children and animals have a connection to the spirit world because of their innocence. As the music plays and the work continues, a large herd of deer gathers on the hills overlooking the spiritual site. It's as though they instinctively know something unique will soon happen here. One of the things that I actually have noticed ever since we've been here is the trees will move at odd times and they'll start to rustle. And, that, and for me, I almost feel as if that's the spirits moving the trees and telling us that they're here, that they know that we're here and that we have the work ahead of us to do to bring them home. As the finishing touches are put on the site, there's time for one last dance, a round dance, led by the heartbeat of a nation. The sounds of a drum, which is commonly associated with native peoples, used in ceremony and social gatherings. Everyone is encouraged to unite by joining hands. Soon, the site will be turned over to the spiritual elders. With a new day dawning, a large Canadian military plane taxis along the runway and into position. The advance team eagerly awaits the arrival. First Nation drummers play a welcoming song. On board are traditional spiritual leaders who will perform the calling home ceremony. Also among them are about 20 Inuit First Nations and Métis veterans of the Second World War. All have arrived to mark Canada's Year of the Veteran and to take part in the spiritual journey to the battlefields of Europe where they'll tour the sites of fallen soldiers, to learn about the wars, the people, and the sacrifices, to share their experiences and their cultures, to remember, to heal. Despite spending nearly nine hours flying from one continent to another, the spiritual elders have little time to waste. No sooner are they checked into their hotel room, they board a bus bound not for the site which will host the calling home ceremony, but a group of military cemeteries to as quickly as possible connect with the spirits of fallen soldiers. Their first stop is a German cemetery filled with 4,400 soldiers, some as young as 14, that had accidentally gassed themselves in a failed attack on Allied forces during the First World War. They were buried eight deep by local farmers. Elders say prayers by moss-covered trees and offer tobacco. For Aboriginal spiritual leaders, tobacco is the first plant given by the Creator and is used in ceremony. It's one of four sacred medicines for prayer, requests, and thanksgiving. I put tobacco, too, all over the place when I go. I put tobacco. That's the communication with the spirit to say miigwech. Thank you very much to call me here. 
Just down the road, St. Julian Memorial marks the site of a valiant stand by 18,000 Canadian troops who withstood the first German gas attacks in 1915. Ojibwe spiritual leader Dominic Rankin carefully searches headstones at Tycott Cemetery, where an estimated 11,000 Allied soldiers are buried. He's on a personal crusade in search of the gravestone that bears the name of a cousin. He scans one headstone after another until finally he spots it. H.W. Rankin, just 27 years old. The search is over. It's a sense of closure for the Rankin family and the 15,000 member Algonquin nation in northern Quebec. Y yesterday, I was uh, I'm feeling something is going to happen to me. So, um, and I, I told my, uh, my sister, said, maybe we're going to find cousin, maybe it's right here. So, um, for me, I think is uh, my feeling to today, I'm very happy. I'm happy to, to see uh, my family here. And um, I think is, uh, that's why I want to bring over there home, the spirit. So uh, I think about two uh, uh, ancestors, my grandfather, Rankin family, and my dad too. So uh, they all passed. So uh, we are all brothers and sisters now, and co some cousins. And uh, uh, I think we, we have s something to say when you go back, this is spirit. A sense of closure is what many here are searching for, not only for themselves, but for their family and friends back home. Everyone is convinced that's what this spiritual journey will deliver, along with long overdue recognition for Aboriginal warriors. Well, I think especially those people back home, like those that has lost relatives over here, and a lot of them were, never came home from here. And during World War II, and so it was like something was missing and it'll be quite the thing to, to come here to, to do all these ceremonies and hopefully that we can take something back with us and to us it'll be taking the spirits home of the people that, is, that are laying over here. It's not just our Aboriginal soldiers that are going to come home, it's all of the, all the soldiers. You know the uh, the elders are going to feel all that pain, and they're going to be, they're going to send, they're going to do what they can to send every every soldier home, to their countries, to their families. You know those young boys that died from Germany, you know send them home to their families. You know and uh, uh, yeah, they're all going to go home. Uh, I have no doubt. The spiritual site is now ready. But because we're not allowed to tape the ceremonies, we make our way up to Hill 62, site of the first battle in history near Ypres that was fought under the Canadian flag. An important vantage point lost to the Germans and then regained on June 13, 1916 by a determined Canadian contingent, but not before mounting losses of 8,400 brave souls on that single day trying to stop the fierce German offensive from capturing the last few square kilometers of Belgian territory. This is one of several cultural memorial ceremonies of remembrance that will be held during the next few days. Throat singers reach deep down inside their souls to echo the sounds around them, the wind, the rushing waters of the oceans, the walrus. The result, a unique sound spawned by a unique culture, the Inuit of Canada's north. A traditional Inuit oil lamp is lit as a symbol to awaken the spirits and to help light their way home. Young Canadian soldiers silently on guard as a prayer is said for their fallen comrades. Sergeant Ron LeBlanc stands as the guard commander for the Canadian forces on this day. To be chosen in, uh, as the guard commander is a very uh, important thing for me and my family. And on behalf of all Aboriginals, this ceremony means, uh, means a lot. Sergeant LeBlanc is a proud Métis from Manitoba who served for 15 years with the BC Regiment. I've been uh, promoting that since I joined and I've, it's very well known to my colleagues that 
who I am and what my background is, and this only reinforces what I've uh, I've said, and it uh, it brings it up to much more people that don't know our background and the sacrifices that our people have have done for the country. Sierra Noble is known in the Métis community in Manitoba as a fiddling sensation, trained to play the old-style Métis tunes that many fiddlers don't play anymore. Her rendition of Grandma Blanche, also called the Métis Prayer, is a tribute to her grandmother. The tune struck a chord each time she played it. When I play Grandma Blanche, there's always, it's always slightly different everywhere I play it. Mm -hmm. And um, it was a, a really emotional place to be so you could really feel all the spirits of our people there. For 15-year-old Sierra, the spiritual journey was almost overwhelming. She felt not only the pressures of performing each day in front of large crowds, she was also viewed as a young role model and as the spirits were awakened, she was especially caught off guard. Spirits tend to come to us for guidance, I guess, and um, today was really the first time that um, it it kind of frightened me because it was so such a forward contact and it was, in, I was at the hotel um, so I didn't really know what to do so I just I talked to one of the elders and he gave me some good guidance on that. But back on stage Sierra gets lost in her music playing for the Belgian crowd gathered at this park in the heart of Ypres. Both the young and old seem to enjoy the Aboriginal entertainment. I'm even a, a teacher in an um, uh, elementary school. Um, we teach about uh, these things in, uh, in school because it's very important that they know that um, war isn't a game. It's uh, something that's really serious with uh, a lot of casualties. At Juneau Beach, the arrival of Canadian Governor General Mikhail Jean on her first official international visit. She joined Aboriginal youth in walking along Juneau Beach, offering words of encouragement and urging them to listen to elders and veterans and to take what they hear from the spiritual journey to tell others when they return home to Canadian soil. Her Excellency is a marvelous woman. She's been open to the youth and the veterans since she's been around. and. Um, what we dis discussed with her was about the uh, how she'd always stand by us. She specifically said to us that she'd always be there for us. I've uh, experienced how important it is to be a Canadian person and to be an Aboriginal person because of the sacrifices made by our veterans and our fallen warriors. With the sun barely rising, Canadian troops flanked by British forces to the left, American troops to the right came storming ashore here on Juneau Beach, June 6, 1944. This house was the first to be liberated as the Queen's own rifles came ashore. But in their cause, nearly 100 died moments into the battle. Today, the house stands as a lasting reminder of the invasion of Normandy, which sparked the start of a bloody military campaign. A few kilometers from Juneau Beach, more than 2,000 Canadians lie at Beni Samer. Among them, at least 33 Aboriginal soldiers. It's said uh -huh. healing comes when you're able to acknowledge grief and losses. Howard Anderson left Gordon's Indian Reserve in Saskatchewan at the tender age of 16 to join the Army. For me, the Army taught me a lot of how to make a living and make it worthwhile to live. You know, I learned more from the Army than I did from going nine years to residential school. Anderson and a relative from the Gordon Reserve, Kenneth Pratt, were both aged 20 when they hit Juneau Beach together on D-Day. Pratt didn't make it. This is Anderson's third visit to Benny Samer to search for his cousin's gravesite. K.W. Pratt, there he is. So that's what he bought in the Winnipeg Rifles. Oh my God. His mother was my sister. Yeah, Dad. Yeah, Gordon's Indian Reserve. We've been watching and trying to find it because they weren't sure where it was themselves, you know. Private Leo Goulet, a Métis veteran from Alberta, walks quietly along Juneau Beach. His mind flashes back to the bombs, the heavy machine gun fire, the panic, the fallen. When I look at that beach there, I always think about the ones that were laying there that never waited back. Eh? 
The memories remain strong more than 60 years after he landed here as an infantryman with the Royal Winnipeg Rifles B Company. Well, I just feel like it's, I don't belong here or something. I don't know. It's just something that I never did belong in here in the first place when I landed 61 years ago. But Europeans are happy the Allied forces did arrive. Still, Goulet rarely talks about his wartime experiences, believing few would understand what he went through. He was among the Canadian troops captured merely days after landing on Juneau Beach. He spent 11 long months as a prisoner of war in a German concentration camp, trying to stay alive in horrible, cramped conditions, scared to death. With slop for food, Goulet lost 70 pounds during captivity, weighing less than 95 pounds when he was finally freed. Perhaps returning to European soil, walking along the beach, talking with young Canadian soldiers, will help to bring about closure. War is war, so it's something that uh, we all don't want, but we were not obligated to do it. We've done it on our own, and I think all these poor souls that died on this beach, come out of the woodwork and the, and the prairies or wherever, and sacrifice their lives for this. And I, I, feel, I feel for them. The the veterans that are here today and the families that lost their loved ones here, now they're trying to find that sense that you were here with them when, they're, when they get killed, that your spirit is part with them. And like back home when you have a funeral,